8, beginning in verse 1, the title of our message this morning is Authentic Faith. Authentic Faith. You can follow along the notes uh, in your iPads or smartphones if you don't have the app. Just search for Calvary Hillsboro and you are good. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning because we know that you would pour your word into our lives and transform our hearts. God, use us for your glory. We come this morning teachable, moldable, ready to hear your word. So pour your spirit out upon us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Taking a running start, what's happening recently here in the book of Acts, remember that a complaint arose uh, amongst the Hellenistic Jews who were saying that this is in the early church, they were saying that their widows were being uh, overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And so, you know, the church, there's some grumbling going on. And so the, the disciples uh, said this, find seven men that can serve in the food, can administrate things and oversee, uh, men with good reputation, men that are full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. And so they chose these seven men. And the disciples then were dedicated to prayer, the ministry of the word, as the church is being fed, you know, on the, on the word of God. Remember, one of those men we looked at last week was Stephen. Stephen, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit. He's out there, and he's also declaring Jesus, you know, openly as the Messiah. So what happened was that there were a group of people from this synagogue of the freedmen, Jewish synagogues out there somewhere in the, the, the provinces, and they decided to challenge and they want to argue with Stephen because of what he's declaring here, you know. And they, they take umbrance to this. And so they're, they're trying to confront him, but they can't cope with his wisdom. And they can't cope with the spirit uh, of which he is speaking. So they decided to do something kind of underhanded. They, they started to falsely accuse, stir up a crowd against them, saying all kinds of things. This man says stuff about Moses, you know. And the crowd dragged these guys out and, and, and brought Stephen in front of the, the council, the Jewish Sanhedrin, Jewish leaders. And so he's there standing in front of them and gives this amazing speech. I mean, it is so full of the Holy Spirit, so full of power, that when he finishes with it, he has his view into heaven itself. And they look at him, he's got, they say he's got the face of an angel. There's something physically happening, spiritually. And he has a view into heaven, and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What did he say to them? He brought them back over their Jewish history, and he said, let me point out to you that there were people who had faith, they trusted God, and they had a right heart. But there were others in your history who were rebels, who resisted God at every turn, they resisted the Holy Spirit, and then he followed up and said, and you have become the betrayers and the murderers of the righteous one whom God has sent. Wow. The place erupted. I mean, they just erupted in anger. And they, in one impulse, they, they rushed upon him, seized hold of him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. The first martyr of the church. But so full of the Holy Spirit. And not full of himself, he's full of the Spirit. So much so that as he is dying, he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. It's a powerful thing. Now, this is important what happens next because this event that I'm describing right here, this event touched off a firestorm of persecution against the church. Saul, we read about him last week, he was standing there when Stephen was being stoned and he was actually holding their coats giving hearty approval, agreement to this thing. Yeah, take him, take him out. Saul got permission from the Jewish leaders to go house to house, drag them out, house to house, men and women, putting them in prison. And as a result of this persecution, the church is just scattered, turned upside down. The church is just scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, and only the apostles stay in Jerusalem. What do you make of all this? I mean, things were going so well. 
They were just having a great time. Now they were being fed on the word of God. They are breaking bread together. They're enjoying fellowship. They're praying together. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe among them. Signs and wonders are taking place. Everything was going so well. And why? It just got all turned upside down. Interesting. Were they fulfilling what Jesus had asked them? See, did, did God want the church just to be a Jerusalem thing? And, you know, uh, everybody together in a large Christian kibbutz, you know, and hanging out together, enjoying the communal life, just enjoying eating together, fellowship, then the church is good. No, wait a minute. Jesus said, this is in Acts 1.8, he said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you are going to go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even the uttermost parts of the earth. But they were just hanging out there and enjoying, and there's nothing wrong with the fact they were enjoying their fellowship, their worship, they were learning the word of God, but God's going to use this. He's going to use it to, to move them out into the uttermost parts of the world. Reminds me a bit of the early Calvary Chapel days. You know, this great move of God amongst the hippies, and, and revival, you know. And what's interesting is you think about this because there was kind of some similar things. They, they had these Christian communes, you know, and the question is very similar. Did God want them to just kind of hang out there, stay there forever, you know, in these great Christian communes? You can just imagine, you know, hippies sitting around playing the guitar all day, worshiping, like this is good, you know, this is great, taking meals together, studying God's word hour by hour, going out to the beach, doing a little witnessing, come back, playing the guitar some more, you know, eating together, you know, reading the word of God, just, hey, is this what God wants, just year after year doing the same thing right here? No, you know what's interesting? They didn't do that. They actually took it out. These hippies started to spread out city by city, town by town. They start starting uh, Bible studies and churches throughout all of California and then up here in Oregon, throughout the United States, and now all over the world. Now that's the way God wants it to be. You look at the book of Acts right here in this chapter, and it's about taking the gospel out, leading others to Christ. But it's about authentic faith, too. When people receive that, they're going to take it out, but how is it received? We're going to follow the story of Philip in this chapter. He was one of those seven that uh, had been chosen in the distributing of the food and all that. After the persecution, he leaves Jerusalem, and he's going to share the gospel with two men, one in the city of Samaria, up in the north, and then one on the road to the south towards Gaza. Uh, Gaza would be, the, like today we call it the Gaza Strip down by the Mediterranean. He's going to be on the road. Another receives Christ, but very different. It's about authentic faith. Let's read the story. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Now Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. Now on that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, that is, except for the apostles. And some devout men buried Stephen, made loud lamentation over him, and Saul began ravaging the church, entering house by house, dragging off men and women, putting them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria. And he began proclaiming Christ to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, were giving attention to what was said by Philip. As they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice. Many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was much rejoicing in that city. The gospel being spread out of Samaria. Let's stop there for a moment. We'll look at the other verses, but I want to go through and see what's happening. God is on the move. He's going to take the terrible persecution, the events now that have happened to the church. Terrible, tragic. But God's going to use it. God is on the move. And what we're going to see is that God is now going to move through these men. 
And I think that we need to look personally at that same desire. God, move through me. That's the point. Be moved by God. See, this is important. Churches turned upside down. Their peaceful worship communities broken apart. But as we saw last week, authentic faith will trust God even in the midst of trouble. Even when trials come, even when difficulties come, they keep their faith, they keep looking to God. In fact, one of the principles from God's word is that God will often use trouble to accomplish his purpose in our lives. One of the principles we need to see. However, the key is faith. You've got to have that perception, that understanding. Because many times when people get into great difficulty, they want to know why. And they begin to, to call out why. If they can't understand why, they're going to accuse God. Why? Why? Why, God? God often does not give an explanation. But see, the key is faith. Because faith trusts God's heart. I know your heart for me. I know that even, even in the midst of trouble and difficulty, I know your heart. Faith trusts God's hand. I know your hand. I know your hand will lead me. I know your hand will take hold of me. I know you'll pour your favor on me. And so faith is the key to trusting in the midst of it. But see, here's what we need also, is to know when God is on the move. There needs to be a spiritual awareness. Like when some things start to happen, your spiritual antennas need to go up. God's doing something. God's doing something right now. I, can, I understand the way God moves, and I know that God's doing something right now. Troubles are arising. Difficulties are coming. God's on the move. Some, he's going to do something. I know my God. Your spiritual antennas become very perceptive. See, it's important to understand God will use those difficult times. In fact, the church throughout history has been known to be strongest when it's been in its most difficult hours. In fact, the opposite is also true. When it's been in times of ease, everything's going good, the sun is shining, there's no challenges, it's all good, we're just having a great time, you know? It's like this. People really don't grow a lot spiritually on vacation. You know what I'm saying? And so it reminds me of a story about this, this uh, company on the East Coast. This is many, many years ago. They were very famous for their fresh uh, cod. And, you know, there on the East Coast, Maine cod is some of the best in the world. And they were famous because they could get it to the market fast, you know, and it's in the cold water there, you know, and it's, it's you know, firm and flaky, and it's just great. Now, this was before the days of IQF fish, individually quick frozen. Today they freeze it on the boat, you know, and it's, it's like that. But in those days, they had to get it to the market fresh. Well, somebody came up with the idea, hey, let's expand our market. Let's go to the Midwest. But we got to have the fresh, uh, the fish fresh. So how about this? We'll take seawater, and we'll fill up, sh you know, shipping containers on a train, and we'll pour these cod into this uh, seawater, and we'll ship it to the Midwest. And when we get there, they're alive, and therefore they're going to be fresh. The problem was it didn't work because these, you know, these, these fish are being shipped now across the rails and they're just you know, go, going mile by mile you know, down the rails and the water's getting warm you know, and they're getting spoiled. They're this life of ease you know, and they start getting demanding. Waiter, more caviar. You know, and uh, they got to the market. They're like spoiled. They're flaky. They're not flaky. They're soft. There's no flavor to it. You're probably wondering what the point of the story is. The point of the story is that in the same way, people at ease do not grow spiritually. So what they decided to do is this. I know what let's do. Let's take the natural enemy of cod and put him in there with the cod. And so they added all these catfish in there. And so all the way from the East Coast to the Midwest, the catfish are chasing the cod around everywhere, this corner, that corner, and they get there, and now they're firm and flaky. <laughs> See, there's an aspect that God would use the troubles. See, the key is faith, isn't it? The key is faith. Because here's the point. If your faith is shipwrecked, and you're angry with God, 
Because you're going through the trouble, you're not watching, you're not aware of what God is doing. You're just focused on your anger. You're just focusing on your bitterness. You're just focusing on what's wrong in your heart. Watch. God is on the move. When difficult times come, God is on the move. Reminds me of when we were going through Bible college. And uh, many of you know my story. God miraculously, wondrously provided for us to be able to go to Bible college. But we still had to, you know, put food on the table and pay rent and all this. Well, I'm, I'm taking, you know, full-time classes, and, and we're living on just very little bit. We got to the point where we were out of money, and we were out of food. And I've never come to that point before. And I remember I was sitting in the, in the cafeteria, and I was just sitting by myself, and I was eating the last sandwich we had, which was peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Thank you. On two heels of red. <laughs> and I wrapped it in aluminum foil so I could reuse the aluminum foil every day. <laughs> but here's the point. Okay, here's the point. I, I was actually surprised what happened next. Because I'm sitting there, you know, and I'm just like, okay, God, this is it. This is it. This is the last sandwich. I think we had a little oatmeal for breakfast. That's it. Something came over me. I actually became excited. It's like there's this joy that came over me, and, and my heart went like this. God, you know what this means? This means that you're going to do something. Because I know your word, I know your promises, and when we get to this point, hey, you said in your word that you're our daily bread, you're our provision. I can't wait to see what you're going to do. There was just something that arose in me. So I'm just sitting there in the cafeteria and I'm just praying, God, you know, open my, help me. Open my heart to understand what you want to do here. And I started thinking about this old woman. An old woman in the church who had asked quite some time back for someone to come over and chop wood. And I thought, hmm, that's been a, quite some time. I wonder. So I called her. Mary, this is rich. I was just wondering, did anybody ever come over to your house and chop your wood? No, dear, no one ever did. Would you like me to come over and chop that wood for you? Oh, dear, you would be such a sweetheart. Thank you, I would really appreciate it. Mary, are you still paying somebody to do that? <laughs> yes, of course, I would love to pay you, dear. And so I come over there, and I'm just having a great time. I'm just chopping her wood, like, this is awesome. And, and I make little bags of kindling for her, and she comes out. Don't you want a break, dear? No, no, I'm good. Because she paid me $20. $20 buys a lot of food, especially in 1985. <laughs> it's like, God, thank you. You know what's awesome? She needed that wood cut. She was like praying, who's going to cut my wood? Like, oh, man. Antenna is going up. God is doing something. Just a small little picture. See, last week we read an interesting thing. It was about Joseph. Joseph seemed like everything was going wrong. I mean, he had all these promises that God was going to use him in great ways, and then everything broke. Everything went wrong. Disaster upon disaster. But God was on the move. This is the thing we have to see. He's betrayed by his brothers. He's sold into slavery in Egypt. But many years later, as God worked through Joseph to become governor in Egypt, and thus had the authority to be able to save his entire family from the terrible famine that came upon the land, was beginning to be revealed. In fact, at one point, the brothers then, they all come together and Joseph makes a speech. And this is actually Genesis 50, 20. We looked at it because it's key to understand. Joseph said, now look, as for you, you meant it for evil. I mean, he's just calling it straight. As for you, you meant it for evil against me. But God meant it for good. In order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. See, go back to Acts. Here in the book of Acts, God uses the persecution, this attack against the church, to disperse them throughout Judea and Samaria. Now the gospel is going to be taken throughout the cities of the known world. Notice in verse 4. 
that those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. See, they didn't go about upset with God. They didn't go leaving Jerusalem saying, can you believe this? Man, we had it going on. There was like fellowship. We were studying together. We were like singing songs together. And then God, the whole thing, wow, God. No, 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 that's not what happened. They leave Jerusalem, and they're just preaching the word. They're just telling people about the mighty things that God has done. Philip goes to the Samaritan people, down to Samaria. The Jews didn't even like the Samaritans. He didn't care. He just got a heart. He just got exciting news. He wants to share it. And he wants to tell people, and it's exciting to see what's happening. God is on the move, and Philip wants to be moved by God. I love this picture. God's on the move. And he wants to be moved by God. Oh, use me, God. He has done what? He's taken hold of hope. Take hold of hope. It's way better. It's a way better way to live. Take hold of hope. It's an anchor to the soul. This is right out of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. It says, We who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. What a picture is that? A hope both sure and steadfast. Take hold of it. But back to chapter 8, here's a very important key. God is on the move. I want to be moved by God, but here's a key. Get yourself out of the way. Get out of the way for God to move. Let's read this story. Beginning in verse 9. Now, there was a certain man there named Simon. He used to formerly practice magic in the city. Interesting. The occultic arts. Magic. He's amazing. them. It says here, he's astonishing the people of Samaria. Get this part here. Claiming to be someone great. He's like impressing them, but he's claiming to be great. Watch what I can do. You see? Watch this, the impression of, and he said, in fact, it says this, and they all from smallest to greatest were giving attention to him saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. That's right. I am the great power of God. You watch what, now he, and he does all these things, and you watch, I'm the great power. What? He's a fake Verse 11, but they're giving attention to him because he had for a long time astonished them with these magic arts. He was good. But when they believed Philip, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were, they were like being baptized, men and women alike. And get this, even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Now, why was he amazed? Because he knew fake and he knew real. And he's amazed. See, what I did was fake. That is real. That is amazing. He's astonished. Now, when the apostles, verse 14... In Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Interesting story. So they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. And we would suppose then with evidences of the Holy Spirit moving, signs, uh, uh, the, the evidences of the Spirit being seen. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, get this, he offered them money. Wow. So you lay your hands on them, and then they receive the Holy Spirit, and the evidence is, I will pay you for that. How much would you take for that? I mean, that's, that is something I want to have. And he says, verse 19, give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. I'll pay you for that. Now, Peter is there, and Peter is the one who's going to respond to him. Now, if you know Peter, you might guess that Peter's going to be not exactly happy with this. 
So Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you. There is a, a, another version of the Bible that puts it this way, to hell with you and your silver. It's like, wow, that's kind of strong. That's Peter. And he said, may your silver perish with you because you thought that you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter. Here it is. For your heart is not right before God. Your heart's not right. What a great lesson for us. And then he tells him how to get his heart right. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray that the Lord, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bondage of iniquity. The gall of bitterness. The poison. Poison. And the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered, and he said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Hmm. Interesting story. Simon is in the way. He's famous in the city. He's astonishing people with his magic. They're all claiming, you know, he is what is called the great power of God, and he's taken it. He's claiming to be someone great. I am the great power. He's a fake. But interestingly, he makes a profession of faith and is even baptized. Now, God can take someone from any background. I'm convinced of it. God can take someone from any background and transform him and use that person for his glory. I've seen people from darkest, most worldly backgrounds. I've seen a witch come to faith in Jesus Christ. I know he can take, I can take, he can take the, the darkest soul and transform that life. But here is the key. You gotta let go of the old. You gotta let go. He takes it out of the mud. He takes us out of the mess of our lives. And then he washes. He makes pure. But you've got to let go of that stuff because that stuff will keep its grip on you if you don't. And in fact, it tells us 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. God's doing something new. But here is the key. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Let go of the past. See, how do you get yourself out of the way? Let go. Let go of that stuff that's got their grip on you. Simon makes a profession of faith, even baptized. Here's a question. Is it possible to believe and yet not be saved? That's an interesting question. Is it possible to believe and not yet be saved? In the book of James... He makes a very interesting statement. This is James chapter 2, verse 19. He said, you believe, you believe that God is one? Great, you do well. But he said, look, even the demons believe, and they have enough sense to shudder. Believe? Is it enough? John chapter 2, verses 23 to 25 is also interesting. When Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed because they observed the signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. They saw his signs. Well, that's amazing. And so they believed. They said, well, that's amazing. He said, he has someone amazing. Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew their hearts. He didn't believe in them. Hearts. What does he say to Simon? Your heart is not right. The heart. See, Simon had enough experience in the occult to discern that this was real. He knew it was real. Because he, he knew what the fake was. He knew what the occult was. That was real. So he believed because he saw the signs. But what about the heart? Your heart's not right, man. See, in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, for with the heart... A person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. That's interesting. Because confessing with the mouth without believing with the heart is of no value. This is not a magic formula where you just say the words. What is God looking for? He's looking for the heart. 
Reminds me of this story. Many of you know, uh, many years ago, I was in the restaurant business, and my partner came to faith in Jesus Christ. And it was a, an exciting thing to see. You know, I, he just was one of those new believers with new believer zeal. That's what you want to see in a new believer. I mean, he is so excited about, you know, the Lord's doing all this stuff. He wants to share it with people. He wants to, and he's just, the thing is, he doesn't quite yet understand how all this works. And I came in to, to came into work one day, and he had one of the employees kind of buttonholed, and he was saying to him, look, just repeat after me. Just say the words. Just say these words. Just repeat after me. Just say these words. And I came up to him and I go, can I talk to you? It doesn't work that way. It's not, it's not a little magic formula. God wants the heart. It's all about the heart. In fact, in Deuteronomy 10, 12, what does the Lord God require from you? You fear the Lord your God. That's heart. To walk in all of his ways and love him. That's heart. Serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. It's about the heart. Someone said to Jesus, what is the greatest of all commandments? Jesus responded, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So here's the problem. When Simon saw that the spear is you know, bestowed on the, by the laying of hands, he's offering them money. Today, if somebody pays for position, or if somebody pays for influence, it's actually called simony, after this account here in the book of Acts. Simony, paying for. See, you know what's interesting? Simon could have had it for free. Interesting. Why would you even ask to pay for it? Your heart's not right. Here's the thing. Simon, you're in the way, man. Simon is in the way of God moving in his life. This is an important lesson. Because I know many people, they are the ones in the way. See, Peter told them how to get out of the way. Repent of this. Repent of this stuff that's in your heart. Repent of this wickedness and pray for forgiveness. Simon answered and he said, you pray to the Lord for me. I'm sorry. That's not going to work either. The heart. Let's go to the next story because it shows us something else very important. Philip is being moved by God. And here is this great insight for all of us. Man, let God move through you. God always moves through people. Someone comes to faith, someone begins to hear, it's through people. Let's read the account of this. Verse 25, And so when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem. And they were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, and he said, Now arise and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza, that is the desert road. Gaza remembers that area along the Mediterranean's very far south. It's called the Gaza Strip today. Hamas has control of it. Back in those days, Israel did. So he says, go to the road that leads to Gaza. There's two roads. One goes directly west, very beautiful, through the trees. Other one south, that's the desert road. Go there. So he does. Verse 27. As he arose... And went, behold, there was an interesting scene. He comes upon an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official. He's somebody important. A court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. And he had come to worship, uh, come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning now and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. What a coincidence. And the Spirit said to Philip, go up and join the chariot. So when Philip had run up, he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and he said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of Scripture that he happened to be reading 
just so happened to be from Isaiah 53. What a coincidence. The greatest, most significant chapter in the entire Old Testament that speaks clearly of Jesus Christ. In fact, it's so interesting because you could ask a Jew today, can you explain Isaiah 53? They cannot do it. Because it is only through Jesus Christ is it explained. And he just so happened to be reading in Isaiah. And he just so happened to be reading Isaiah 53. Isn't that a coincidence? Do you believe in coincidence? He is being led by the Holy Spirit. Even the Ethiopian is being led by the Spirit and does not yet know it. So he is reading from Isaiah 53. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who shall relate his generation, for his life is removed from the earth? Now, the eunuch answered Philip and said, Now, please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? And Philip said, I have no idea. Actually, that's not what he said at all. Because he does have an answer. And here's the point. Wouldn't it be awesome? You want to be used of the Lord? Man, I want you to move through me. God, I want you to make divine appointments for me. See, I'm convinced that God does this. I'm convinced that God will make divine appointments today. The question is, you know, the heart, do you want to be used of the Lord? Yeah, I do, Lord. Make divine appointments for me. And here's a great key. Be ready to give an answer. See, when you, when you start praying, God, make those divine appointments, be ready. Be ready to give an answer. In fact, there's a great scripture. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. God, I want to be used. God, open doors for me. Make divine appointments. You know what? You would be surprised how many people are very interested. You'd be surprised. And they've got questions. Not, not, not that you have to have every answer, but wouldn't it be great if you could even, as Philip explained that? Notice what it says. Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Beginning here. He just started here, and then he started, I'm thinking he went through the Jewish feasts, and he's explaining Jesus is fulfilled through all of them. And then as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's saying, I do believe. Then you may. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they had come up out of the water, this is an interesting story, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing, no doubt. And he goes to Ethiopia, you know, in Africa, right there south of Egypt, and he's going to share the gospel. Of course he is. In fact, a church arises out of there. Philip found himself at Azotus, like 20 miles away. This is an amazing story. And he passed through, and he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities and came to Caesarea up there in the north along the coast. What a story. But see, this is really very important for us to understand. I want to be used to the Lord. Move through me, Lord. What's the key? That's what he tells the Ethiopian. Believe with all your heart. Believe with all your heart. God, I want to be used. Then take hold of faith. God, move through me. If you believe with all your heart, this is what God desires. He wants us to believe, to love Him, to trust Him with our lives. You know what's interesting? Speaking of coincidences, there is only one other place in the Bible that speaks about an Ethiopian eunuch. Only one other place in the Bible. Jeremiah 38 and 39. You know what's interesting? We just so happened to be teaching through the Bible and taught on that very passage this last Wednesday. 
So of all the places, there's only two places in the entire Bible where there's an Ethiopian eunuch, and we taught the first one on Wednesday, and here we are, the second one on Sunday. I just thought that was interesting. I want to be used of the Lord. I wonder, I wonder if that Ethiopian eunuch here, if he read that account, if he read about that Ethiopian in Jeremiah 38. Because that Ethiopian was a good man there. He trusted the Lord there. It was Jerusalem's darkest hour. The Babylonian army was about to breach the city. The walls were about to come down. But there was Jeremiah. He'd been thrown into a pit and he was sunk into the mud. And so he went to the king and he said, Jeremiah will die there. And the king said to him, then take 30 men under your charge, he had authority, and take them out. So he goes and he he gets some rags, some old clothes, and he throws them down into Jeremiah. He says, put these under your armpits. And he brings down a rope and says, now put them next to the rope, under the rope. 30 men, they're pulling them out. Jeremiah is saved. Interesting. Later, the Lord said to Jeremiah, you go And you tell that Ethiopian this. This is Jeremiah 39, verses 17 to 18. I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord. I will certainly rescue you because you have trusted in me. His heart was right. He was a good man. His heart was right. God's on the move. I want to be used of you, Lord. Move through me. Whenever I hear this account in Acts 8, particularly the part about the baptism, Reminds me of the very first time we went to Russia. I'll never forget because we hired this guy uh, to be our interpreter. His name was Sergei. He was an atheist. And uh, he went day by day with us interpreting the gospel. He's an atheist. And uh, we had this big gathering, you know, we had the band, we're going to have this outreach, and so we're going, inviting people, and he's going with me, I'm explaining what we're doing. So that that night, we had the outreach, the band is playing, and then I came up and I gave the gospel, talking about what God wants to do. But there was Sergey in the very front row. He's listening very carefully. His English is very good. And he knew where I was going because at one point I said, now, I'm going to give you an opportunity to receive, to respond. God is knocking on your heart. He wants you to open the door and let him in, to respond by giving him your heart. And I'm going to ask that you, and you can see Sergey in the front row. He's getting, he's crouching down. He's getting his legs in position. He's getting ready. I think, my goodness, he's waiting. And I, and I said, if you would like to respond and receive, and I pause just for the effect of it. If you want to receive Jesus Christ, stand on your feet. And he just, he just bounded up to his feet. He's like right in front of me. That's Sergey. And I just reached over and I hugged him. What a glorious thing. And others responded, of course. A few days later, we decided to baptize those that had come to faith. And uh, there was the Amur River. So we went down there. I'll never forget this day. It was actually kind of uh, windy, and it had been stormy. And so the, the waves in the river, the, river, the Amur River is quite wide there. The waves were kind of rolling in. But we're going for it. And there's Sergey. First thing, bright and early, wants to be first to be baptized. What a heart. What a desire. So we're out there like, okay. So we go out there. And, you know, when you're baptizing in in waves like this, it's actually a little easier because you don't have to, uh, you know, lay them down. You just have to time it right. (laughs) So I'm, you know, holding on to them like this. And I baptize you in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit, and boom. <laughs> and he's like, yes, what a way to be baptized. There is still a church there in that city. Do you know who the pastor is? Sergey. I want to be used of the Lord. I want to be used of the Lord. Well, his heart's right. His heart's right. See, here's what I'm thinking, guys. We lived this thing one time. Let's do it for the glory of the Lord. We go just one time. Let's do it for God. 
Let's live for his glory. I want to be used of the Lord. God, move through me. Make divine appointments for me. We're only doing this once. Let's do it for him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your heart after us. God, I pray that you'd move on us right now. Touch hearts. You're knocking on hearts now. Showing us you want to move. God is on the move. You're looking for people through whom you would move. Church, this morning, as we're before the Lord, I want to give you the same invitation. God is knocking on the hearts. Your life, how do you want to live it? We only do this thing once. How do you want to live it? God is inviting you to live it for glory, for his glory. Would you even this morning open your heart? Open your heart. Let him in. He'll come in. He'll change you, transform you, forgive, bring power to your life. Do you want even this morning to open your heart? Receive him. Let him into your life. Would you just raise your hand? You know, just in the boldness of the Lord, just raise your hand. God bless you guys. God bless you right there. In the front, in the back. In the very back. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Right there. Anybody else? God bless you right there in the back. God bless you guys. God moving in power, transforming us. God move through us. Move through this church. Move through our lives. We want to be used. We want to give you glory. Would you say this morning even to the Lord, would you say, God, you know what? Make divine appointments for me. Make divine appointments for me. I want to be used of you. I want to, I want to see lives. I do this thing once, God. I want to do it for you. Make divine appointments. For me. Use me. Here am I, Lord. Here am I. Send me. Would you say that to the Lord? Just raise your hand. Here am I, Lord. Here am I.